fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Nerd on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. My co-host today, Mr. Gavin Stone. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that so uh, quietly, so reserved. What can I say? It's the English side of me. Well, I would think it would be the other. You'd be more aggressive. Come on. <laughs> Hello. Get out there. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, wild man. Well, now today we've got another guy that's from your part of the, the world, and he's done all sorts of stuff. Lots of books, nonfiction, British fiction, lots of history. So, Mr. Martin Knight, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Uh, good to meet you, Bob. Martin. So, uh, where did it start for you? Like, I, I noticed, like in in your your latest book, it's uh, Justice Killer, and um, you write a lot about uh, crime and that stuff. Where where did you get the interest for that? It all sort of happened by accident. Um, I I didn't publish a book or write a book or try to write a book till I was about forty years old. And that's about twenty five years ago now. Um, and uh, I was a, a I'm a Chelsea supporter, Chelsea Football Club. You've heard of them? Yeah. Uh, Kevin would have done. Um, and I was at a 40th birthday party for a friend, and there was a guy there who was a former Chelsea football hooligan, um, quite well known, and uh, he had been he was now a a, 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 a a taxi driver, a black taxi driver in London. Uh, at this time, and he had been writing his memoirs in the cab between fairs, and someone, I didn't know him, and someone said, uh, he, he was saying he probably needed some help with it, and someone said, well, Martin's written a few bits, but all I had done was written a few articles for a couple of fanzines, Chelsea football fanzine, um, but we were sort of put together, and um, he said, you know, would you would you read what I've done? And uh I said, yeah, I will do. And I was a bit sort of apprehensive about it because he gave me a sort of sheath of hand, you know, written in biro sort of uh, handwriting. Oh, God, am I going to get through this? But I, I took it home and uh, I started reading it and it was you know, it was very good. Um It sort of touched on the culture of the whole football hooliganism thing um, and, you know, it went sort of deep into his history. So I suggested to him that I add to it and rewrite some of what you've done and we will try it with a publisher. And uh, we did that um, and we sent it to uh, five or six publishers. The book was called Hooli Fan, uh, sort of mesh between hooligan and fan. And um, we sent, as I say, sent it to five or six publishers. One responded very quickly and we, you know, being very inexperienced, uh, took the first offer and then once we'd accepted it, the other four or five all made offers as well. So yeah, <laughs> uh, that was it. anyway. Holy fan was a big success. I think it's probably one of the best-selling uh, books in that genre. That it became a genre. We were one of the first, not the first, but we were one of the first. And that's, so that's how I got into writing. So I became a published author when I was about forty. Wow, and I see you co-authored. You did the I Ran with the Gang, which is about the Bay City Rollers. Yeah founding member so how well that would be interesting and and yeah how how, how honest was that <laughs> well, it was, i think it was very honest I, I wrote it with alan longmuir and um it's funny you know how these books come about none, none of them i've really approached anyone and said yeah would you like to do a book they've all sort of happened by accident and, and that's true and a few years ago probably four or five years ago now um i was with my wife my daughter my son-in-law and my little grandson, first grandson, we were in Spain and we were in, in a in a bar or in a restaurant having a bite to eat. And 
someone mentioned a footballer that I wrote a book about or a book with called Dave Mackay, who was a very famous Scottish footballer, played for Tottenham and Derby County, and he became a very successful manager, uh, very entwined with Brian Clough in his career. And um, a Scottish couple was sitting behind us. We were talking, and he overheard Dave Mackay's name mentioned, and he said, oh, he's a great... He butted into our conversation that he was a great player. And then we got talking, he, he and his wife and our, our little group, and uh, he said to me, you know, who, who would you like to do in an ideal world? So I said, well, I, I haven't done a music personality, and I really would. And I said, ideally, I'd like to do Ringo Starr, because he's the only Beatle that hasn't done an autobiography, a, a, a full autobiography. So he said, well, what about the Bay City Rollers? And I thought, hmm, not so sure about that. But <laughs> uh, I was never a fan, and uh wasn't really my scene. And I said, I, I said, well, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to talk to him. Who is it? He said, well, Alan Longmuir is a friend of mine in the village I live in, in Scotland, Bannockburn, town, I should say. And, and uh, he said, I'll get him to call you. And I just left that bar that night thinking, not thinking anything. You know, it's one of those slightly uh, drunk, not drunk, but, you know, oiled, oiled by alcohol conversations. Didn't expect to hear anything. And... Uh, Maybe two or three months later, my phone rang. I'd, I'd, I'd exchanged it, uh, phone numbers with this guy. And um, my phone rang. He said, hi, it's Alan Longyear here. I used to be in the Bay City Rollers. And I said, yeah, I know who you are. And we went and met. And I went, went up to Edinburgh uh, to meet him. And um, we agreed to do the book, which was I ran with the gang. And I, I, I had a smashing time doing it. Um it was really interesting, and I, and you were asking, you know, is it the truth? Well, there may have been stuff he left out, but I don't think he lied about anything. Um, but there was obviously this unsavoury backdrop to some of their story, which which is which is sort of touched on in the book. So it wasn't your scene, like you. you it's not like you were a fan listening to them. The I, I became a fan. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, did it, did it change your opinion of of who you? It he did. Was? It did because. Obviously, you know, I, I, I sort of looked into them a lot and uh, started listening to their music, get the get the flavour of it, and they actually, you know, people don't really know this, but they 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 wrote some really good songs themselves towards the end of their career, and they had this massive career in England, and then they, when it sort of faded out in England, they became massive in America and Canada. After it faded out there, they became massive in Japan and Australia, and in the Far East. So the career that we in England thought only lasted, but you know maybe two or three years of roller mania at the most, actually actually went on for about 10 or 12, 12 years in, in total. Right, right. I think I think Gavin followed them around. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was a groupie for a few, few weeks. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Did you wear the tartan trousers? I, 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 I wear the tartan trousers anyway most days, you know, if I'm not wearing the leather ones. <laughs> Fair enough. Sadly, uh, Alan died. Alan Longyear, who was the founder member of the group and who I did the book with, he died while we were doing the book. So that was really sad. So he never actually saw it come out. That is too bad. Yeah, that's awful. Well, and, and, but how did you go? Okay, so you're kind of writing stories that are true and they're sort of memoir, sort of. They're more of a, you know, like a history of, of some, some person or some band or something, right? You're doing this, yep. thing, footballs, whatever. How did you turn that into doing... Um, crime or crime fiction or British fiction? How do you get into doing creating a story rather than just taking someone else's? When I, the the, the book we I referred to earlier, Hulifan, from that, we started to get or I, we, we started to get approached and I, I, with my co-author Martin King, we wrote a couple more, but I was then uh, one, in, one was Peter Osgood who was a very famous Chelsea in England footballer and that, that book was uh, very successful and then I got offered to do um, George Best. I don't know if you're aware of George Best, but he's probably uh, the United Kingdom's most famous footballer ever. And um, that that was a very high-profile book. So I sort of got established on do, doing autobiographies with people. Um, and then uh, I wrote my first novel, which was called Common People, which is loosely based on my growing up on a council estate in on the edge of London uh, and the suburbs um, in the 1970s. But yes, yeah, so then I got to true crime. So th- this book, um, Justice Killer, is, a, is my first crime fiction, my first novel in crime fiction. 
and, and, and I'll tell you about that in a sec. But I, I got onto true crime when we met up with a, a guy called um, Philip Sparrowhawk, and he was partnered with another guy called uh, Howard Marks. And Howard Marks was famous as Mr. Nice. He wrote a book called Mr. Nice, and there's been a couple of films made about him. And he was a sort of hippie, hippie drug smuggler in the 70s. They used to say one, four out of every 10 joints smoked sort of had originated with this block, with this guy. And Phil Sparrowhawk was his partner that had previously gone under the radar. And uh, so we, we, we did his book. And then I suppose what really gave me the, the, the idea to do a crime fiction book was I wrote a book called Justice for Joan. I think of a thing about the word justice in my title. And, and Joan, Justice for Joan, the Joan in the title was a, a, a demure librarian called Joan Woodhouse who inexplicably travelled to Arundel in Sussex one summer's day in 1948 uh, and then was found dead in the grounds of Arundel Castle. And it's one of Scotland Yard's longest running unsolved murders. There's all sorts of theories. There were the key suspect. And I sort of uh, did a the first book on that case, really. I, it did quite well and I really enjoyed doing it, the mystery. And it was then when I finished that book that I started writing what became Justice Killer, which is uh, taken some years to, to finish because I had other projects going on and kept going back to it. So it sort of, I sort of drifted in that direction. I'm, I'm going to break all, break all the rules here for a minute, Martin, and I'm going to ask a compound question. Uh, but there is a good reason for it, so I can be forgiven. So is, is there anybody else in your sights at the moment that you would love to kind of, um, you know, uh, write with, or would you prefer to stick to kind of uh, fiction now? And, and what is what is your, your goal for your, your next book, your next project? It's a boring answer, Gavin. I, I don't really have any plans like that. As I said earlier, nearly every book has sort of come from chance meetings or someone approaching me. So I've been very lucky that I've gone from one project to another. At the moment, at the moment, there's nothing in the pipeline. Um, I'd love to do Ringo Starr, as I said earlier, or work with Ringo Starr, but he doesn't need the money. And uh, I, I've written a couple of times, and haven't got a reply, so I don't think it's going to happen. Well, there you go, Ringo Starr. If you're listening, um, you know, get get in touch yeah. because I mean, I believe they've just released the Beatles have actually just released yesterday a new record, apparently, haven't they? That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. It's very good. It takes you have to listen to it a couple of times. Once you've listened to it two or three times, it gets inside your head. It's called Now and Then. I sound like the Beatles. <laughs> <publicist, laughs> don't I? But this could be yeah. great timing for Ringo. You know, you never know. He might uh, he might just drop on lucky to be able to land you. Well, I think I think he's got a great perspective, isn't he? Because he you know he was the man standing sitting behind on the drums. Uh, you know, the other three um, sort of took the limelight. You could say not on purpose, but that's how it. Sort of panned out. I think he'd have a great perspective, especially now with you know, with with the passage of time. I think I think he could write a brilliant book about the whole thing. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Well, don't you have his number? Oh, not anymore. I've changed my phone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he kept ringing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wouldn't answer. Listen, so in in this Justice Killer, let's talk about the premise. What 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 is the premise of the book? Well, the premise of the book is is uh, about an ordinary guy who drifts into becoming a serial killer. You can uh, imagine that. So the the, the key character is, is a, a builder called Paul who's in his 50s. He's done pretty well for himself. Um, his life is going very well. And very sadly, his wife and soulmate dies and he feels utterly empty. I call him a suicide in waiting. He just wants to... He just wants to leave this world, but they have a very young grown up daughter and he just can't, can't do it to her. So he sort of carries on and he's waiting for a time when he can, uh, kill himself basically. So it's, it's quite a sad character in that, in that way. And then one day he, he, he thinks back to an incident when he was at school, when he was a boy where an, a local old man, uh, who he had befriended, on his, on his journey to and from school, a local old man, uh, gets murdered and, uh, a boy in, a boy who was a couple of years older than him at school, who was now at work, was convicted of the murder or uh, charged with the murder and went to court. And, um, he, he gets an alibi from his family and he gets away with it, but everyone in the town knows he did it. 
And indeed, once he got away with it, he actually told people he did it because there was a double jeopardy law in place in those days. You know, 20 or 30 years after the event, he just feels a desire to go and challenge this bloke on behalf of the old boy Wally, who, who was his friend. And he tracks him down, finds out his routine, follows him and kills him. And for the first time in his life, you know, for the first time since his wife Jan died, he actually feels some sort of fulfillment and feels like life could be worth living. And he starts searching around for other, in his mind, similar similar injustices that haven't been righted. And uh, he, he then sort of goes on a mission of working through some, some people that he kills. And then eventually he's faced with, he, he, th- he thinks he has the moral high ground and, uh, uh, he, you know, he's sort of becoming a sort of vigilante. He's trying to get public, you know, he wants to be almost found out. But, uh, the police, in this case, have been a bit incompetent. And um, he, he eventually uh, tries to meet out justice to someone he thinks he's got the moral high ground and certain events prove that maybe he hasn't. So he sort of possibly ends up as being the sort of person he detests. That's the premise mm. of the story. I, I, that, 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 that sounds awesome. How, how have you found like the differences between writing from like kind of non-fiction going to fiction? Have, have you found it harder? And, and is there anything that you've kind of challenges you've had to ha- overcome doing that? Yeah, I did. I, I think fiction is definitely harder because you know with, with 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 the autobiographies that I've done and the non-fiction true crime. Um, well, it's certainly with the autobiographies you, you you've got the person. There's a sort of structure where you you know you, you meet the person get to know the person and then you, you with a tape recorder in hand you take them through their lives and then go home and write it up and go, go back on bits as you know as long as you have access to the person so it's you know you still got to do a good job but it, it is fairly methodical and rudimentary with fiction you know you got you got to think the stuff up and uh you know i found that quite hard and especially with this justice killer the the guy, I found it, Paul, the main character, I found it hard to sort of, it's, it's written in the first person. Oh, okay. I sort of found it, found it hard to find his voice, whether I was making the reader like him when I shouldn't or dislike him when I shouldn't. So there's a whole lot more thought and depth, I think, that goes into a novel. Paul Gar- Garfield, right? You know, one of your main characters. How do you get in the mindset to write this character? Um, because it's not you. It's someone else. It's like when you're writing a, a nonfiction book, you, you've got, information and you can find out about the person who they are what they said and did but in this particular case you're creating this paul so how do you make it so that it it sounds like a real character well i i started off when basing him on someone like me or people i know or people i've been around you know he he was a reasonably successful builder as i say and he probably had the same sort of viewpoint on the world as a lot of working class men of my age have, uh, English men of my age, you know, he, 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 so I, I sort of grounded it in someone like me. And then slowly as these, you know, the, the first murder in a way, sort of, he, I don't want to give away too much of the story, but he, uh, you know, he, he doesn't definitely go with the intention of murdering this guy. He goes with the intention of confronting him and it ends up a murder and he just can't believe that he gets away with it. And I sort of try and imagine how I would be in that situation. And it's as that, the, when the character just created itself and I, I sort of stepped into his thinking. So, you know, I, I was sort of going to bed at night and, well, who can I kill next? You know, um, <laughs> and that's, that's how it was really. And so do you ever kill people, you know, in real life as characters? No, but I, 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 I was thinking people- about if I was, if I was Paul Garfield, you know, who would I maybe think about? targeting next and why and is is it plausible and what i hope the book's achieved it's almost like a true crime book in a way because i i, th- I think it although when you read it on the surface an ordinary bloke becomes a serial killer when you read the book you just think hmm, that you know that could possibly happen it, do- it doesn't seem fantastical i hope do you have did you have sort of a a subtext did you have a meaning behind the story that you wanted readers to get well, I think I think I was touching on on uh, the misery of bereavement and touching on vigilantism and, and sort of frustration. So I didn't really have a meaning that you know I was trying to persuade people of a certain way of thinking or anything like that. 
but I, I hope the book's a bit deeper than just a sort of true crime murder story. And not a true crime, a crime fiction murder story. It certainly sounds like there's some good emotional mixes in there when you say, like, he's becoming the person that he kind of despises and that, that, that's got the brilliant element of conflict in there. Uh, that's yeah. for sure. So did you, ha- did you find yourself having to become more and more inv- inventive in the way you killed people or, or did you do, did you do research on how other? Again, I tried to, you know, bring it back to what, what I thought was plausible. So, you know, this guy didn't kill people with a gun. Um, you know, he, he killed people with his hands, it, 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 mostly. And again, and don't want to give the whole story away, but, um, each, each murder I think is plausible. You know, he planned, he plans them. So I didn't really have to dream up sort of, you know, putting arsenic in people's copy and things like that. Yeah. Sort of rooted in very much everyday life. You, yeah, and you, you involved like a celebrity clairvoyant. Is there an interest in that for you? Is that, is that is something you've had? I've, I've always been interested in it. Um, yeah. So I do tackle that in the book. Um, so clairvoyancy over here is a big thing. Uh, has been for some years. It's been sort of packaged for the television. And I've always felt animosity towards the people that do it. Because I've, I've always felt that, well, one, I don't believe it or didn't believe it. And two, um, I just felt it was uh, a mercenary way of uh, profiting from people's grief. But the book is a lot about grief, I think. And older Paul, basically his, his daughter attends one of these shows at a local theatre and she believes that her mother Jan came through. She comes back to tell her dad and her dad gets really annoyed because he, he's very anti the whole thing. And uh, so he goes to a show himself and pretends to be someone's come through for him and leads, leads this clairvoyant down the garden path, uh, proving to himself that it's a fraud. And he gets more angry with him than any of the other people that he's killed uh, because he, he he just feels that, you know, he, he, he's de- deceiving his family in the most wicked way. And he plans to kill this man. And when he does finally confront him, he says to him, OK, you got, you know, you got, I'll give you my word. You got one. If you can prove to me, you can contact my wife to do, do it now. And, and I'll let you go. I'm giving away far too much here, but uh, the, the clairvoyant. <laughs> manages to come up with something no one else could have possibly known and suddenly Paul is faced with what does he do because if he lets him go you know uh, he's going to be in a lot of trouble and this bloke seems to know stuff about what he's done and he kills him and then he feels that he's he, he tortured him because he feels he's lost his moral high ground because he promised the bloke he'd let him go. So how long did it take you to do this story? Well it, 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 it's taken about 10 years but only, only, only because I started it and then different things came up and, you know, went on. It, it was my background book that I was doing. You know, when, when I was at a loose end, when no one had come up to me in a bar or suggested someone or whatever, I used to work on it. And how it started it didn't even start off as, as a, as a, as a crime, crime fiction novel. When, when I was at school in the 1970s, our school was next door to a dairy and um one day some armed robbers came to this dairy to rob it obviously and they put uh, put the milkman on the floor and said don't look up and apparently one of them looked up or that was the story and he got shot in the back this guy and the, the guy's brother was in the year above me at school and his sister was in my year so i knew the family uh yeah a little bit not close but i knew them and it really sort of upset my childhood happening next to the school murder you know you just you know these were the days of batman and man from uncle and you know these sort of things you didn't think really happened and i was writing about that so i i started writing about that experience and i did it i wrote a few pages about it and uh, maybe enough for a chapter and I thought, where do i go now you know there the, wasn't enough for a book it was just a, a sort of half a chapter really and then i slowly turned that into the murder of the old boy changed the milkman to an old boy and I became Paul and that ended up being the first chapter of Justice Killer and then it, and it started to flow from there so I was stuck at that point for a couple of years so I turned it from a bit of non-fiction starting off with non-fiction into a novel so it, it gave me the impetus to get the novel going so I never ever sat down and thought I'm going to write a crime fiction novel didn't you know it, it just sort of happened 
Has it inspired you now to go on and, and maybe look at other fiction genres that you haven't looked at before and think, I'll give that a try. I might just go down this route. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly would like to do more fiction, whether it be a crime one or not. I, I, I don't think I'm capable of writing romantic fiction. So I'm not sure where I would go. I, so I'd imagine uh, if I do do another, or when I do another novel, it will probably be crime. Well, romance is a crime. <laughs> It can be. Yeah, criminal romance would be good. You could uh, you could go down that route where uh, two serial killers fall yeah, in love. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> possibly. I, I, did, I did a book about uh, heavily featured Canada. Do you know about that one? No. Oh, I, I did a book uh, about 10 years ago, which was true crime. And where I live in Epsom in Surrey, during the First World War, it was a hospital for Canadian soldiers that had been injured during the war. And... So I think there was about a thousand of them living in Epsom during the First World War. And at the end of the war, when everyone was getting shipped home, these soldiers were sort of bottom of the list for some reason. And they got very impatient. And uh, they used to come into the town, into Epsom town, and sometimes you know, get involved in fights and were chasing, chasing the women and so on. And it, this was happening at the same time that the British, the surviving British soldiers or Epsom soldiers were coming home and sort of finding out that their wives, sisters, mothers even, had formed attachments with these Canadian soldiers. But there was a lot of ill feeling. And um, one one day, uh, there was a fight in, in a pub in Epsom. The police came in and arrested two, two Canadian soldiers, marched them up the high street, put them in the police station, uh, to, into a cell in the police station. The police station was basically a, you know, a nice detached house, uh, as they were in those days. This is 1919. And a small crowd gathered outside the police station saying, you know, let them out. And uh, I think the police said, well, we'll let them out in the morning when they sobered up, blah, blah, blah. And because these feelings were running so high, the, this group of Canadians soldiers went back to the camp and managed to rally almost everyone. And, and the whole camp marched on Epsom. And there was a huge riot. And uh, a blacksmith by the name of Alan McMaster, um, he was very big and strong and he managed to rip the bars out of the cell and then with one of the bars he's, he, he struck the sergeant, the, the sort of country sergeant, Sergeant Green, with the bar and killed him. And then Scotland Yard were called in and they arrested five or six Canadian soldiers, including McMaster, um, and they, they identified people by cuts. Their cuts they were uh, deemed to have been involved in, you know, mostly in the, you know, in more more in the fight, and it came at a very bad time because the Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward, was about to tour Canada to try and, or, or, or uh, a lot of the Commonwealth countries, but the Canada was the big one, I think, to try and um, mend the broken bonds between the two countries because uh, the Canadians apparently felt that they suffered disproportionately in the First World War and were beginning to question whether they wanted to be cozied up with the UK anymore. So Edward was going there to try and re repair relations. And obviously it would have been disastrous if we were hanging Canadian soldiers at the time. So there was a, a big cover-up. And um, these guys got sentenced to something like five years each. They, the, the charges were reduced to manslaughter. Hence the name of the book. And, uh, they were back home. Uh, the, the, the murder or the incident happened in June. I think it was Derby Day or the week after Derby Day. And they were back home in Canada for Christmas. So the whole, no one knows about it. The whole case was covered up and there wasn't even a plaque for the sergeant in Epsom. He didn't appear on the Metropolitan Police Roll of Honor. It's quite often said that another policeman called PC Blake that was the first policeman to be killed on the mainland in a riot. It wasn't true. It was Sergeant Green. So I went some way to, you know, put in, put in this case more on the map. But there was a very sad, poignant ending to it. Alan McMaster, the, the blacksmith from Nova Scotia. Well, I, I, when I was writing the book or when I just, just finished it, I can't remember now. You know how emails pop up onto your screen when you, when you're writing, you get the little bubble that comes up. Yeah. This bubble, bubble came up saying Alan McMaster. And I thought, my God, my stomach sort of went over. I thought he was sort of emailing me from the dead. And it was his uh, nephew, who was also called Alan McMaster, who was a, a Liberal MP in, in, in the Nova Scotia Parliament, if, if there is such a thing. I think it was Nova Scotia. And right. 
yeah you know he said you know this this is my my uncle and he said um my great uncle and he said or great granddad and he said i'm going to put you in touch with buddy mcmaster who was a very famous fiddle player in canada who i think died a few years ago and i think his granddaughter is called natalie mcmaster she's currently very well known as a fiddle player and i spoke to him and he was in his late 80s and he sort of brought alan mcmaster to life and what happened was when he went back to Canada in 1919, Timmins, is it Timmins? There was a mining disaster, and because he was such a big man, he managed to hold the the mine for, part of the mine from collapsing, and about 20 men escaped with their lives because of his bravery. That was that. And then in 1929, he walked into a police station in Winnipeg and said, "Look, I killed a policeman in in, in Epsom in, in England, and I was never really punished for it, and I want to be punished." So they telegrammed Scotland Yard. It was the last thing Scotland Yard wanted to hear because this whole thing had been hushed up. And um, they sent a telegram back saying, no, this case is dealt with. Uh, you know, we don't want him. You know, let him go. So um, that was that. And then very, very sadly, in 1939, he committed suicide. So really, this whole sad affair cost two lives. And as a sort of final postscript during my research, I, I uncovered that mo- in that latter part of the First World War, 90% of the patients in this military hospital in, in Epsom were suffering from syphilis. And it, it was um, sort of said the reason they were the last to be sent home, that was considered a crime, contracting syphilis. Oh. And that's why they were treated badly and in, 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 uh, you know, put, put, put to the back of the queue. I mean, they, they, were, you know, they were still in Epsom a year after the First World War had ended. So it was just a powder, wow. it was a powder keg. Yeah, it's pretty amazing when you find out historical things, you know, how... It can draw you right into the story and you end up doing lots of research and getting into yeah. it. You know, that's just, uh, yeah. another book I noticed you do is Barry Desmond is a wanker. So <laughs> yeah. uh, w- what's that about? Is that about it's, me? It's, <laughs> it's, it's about, it's a book about loneliness. So he's a, he's a, he's a guy who, uh, lives with his parents, um, into his thirties or forties. He works for his dad. His dad's a very overbearing man. And he follows his dad into the bank and let's say they both work in, in a, in an old fashioned bank in England. And then his mum and dad die in quick succession and he's left the house and he's got the job at the bank, but they make him redundant once his dad's dead. And although he's got money because he's got redundancy money and he's got the house, he hasn't really got anything else in his life. And because of his overbearing parents, he's never ever, um, developed any social skills. And the crux of the book really is he forces himself to go out into the world to meet people and he gets taken advantage of. And the masturbation thing is he, he, he finds solace in masturbation and sadly thinks he's the only person that does it. And I'm very ashamed of it. That's hence the title of the book. But really, it's a, it's a, it's a book about loneliness. Well, you've got quite an interesting uh, portfolio <laughs> there. Yeah, quite a variety here. We're not, you know. It, it didn't sell very many. Very many. I think the the, the title put people off. Oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I learned a lesson there. Well, you can always retitle it. You know, redo it. Yeah, quick re. I could do. You know, that might help. Yeah, I'll think about that. I one. thought I had a mix of uh, yeah. genres and books, but uh, but that 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 that's one hell of a collection there for all the different uh, styles you've done there. So. Really interesting. I love the, I love the history lesson about the the, uh, the Canadian soldiers and learning all that. By the way, I'm going to be researching that myself later and looking into it, and I'll pro- probably be uh, on Amazon buying that book to read for myself. That was really interesting. Yeah, I think you can, I, there's not many copies left these days. Uh, the pub people that publish it went bust, unfortunately. But it is on ebook, and I did look before I came on. You can you can get it for five dollars or something on. Is it? I've got the name of the site now. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. If you, if you Google it, you'll find it. I found it on Google. Yeah, I will be. Thank you. And Canadians are awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, is it, uh, Alan, is it still uh, illegal to contract any um, STDs over there in Canada? No, actually, we'll oh, get you, them <laughs> <laughs> you can get them at the drive through right? Well, you can get your pot, your liquor, your coffee, and, and your sexual disease STD. <laughs> All in one drive-through nowadays, so it's fantastic. Wow, well, so you've got it. You've got it all sussed over there. Convenience store. Yeah, you can just pay for it on your phone too. 
<laughs> Delivery will be. Oh, next. wow, yeah, that'll, anyway. that'll be something. Wow. Well, so, so listen, Martin, what do you got going next? Uh, you've got this book out now, and you're going to be uh, talking it up. I've got a book coming out in uh, in May, I think, of next year with Harper Collins, and it's a book called Nefarious, and it's the story of a notorious British armed robber called Ronnie Field, um, who was very active in the 60s and 70s. He's probably one of the last of that sort of group of villains uh, alive. He ended up standing trial with one of the Cray twins, the Cray twins' brother, Charlie Cray. Um, that was sort of the end of his criminal career then. So, yeah, that's that's coming out in about May, I think. But how long does it take you to write these books overall? Like, are you doing one or two a year or something? Or In a good year, I can do two a year. Um I mean, once I'm into a book, I can do it, you know, it, 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 it really depends on the access you have to the subject. Right. So someone like George Best was a struggle because he, you know, he's very much in demand. And it was probably the last thing he wanted to do. But um, Ronnie, Ronnie's, you know, not a young man anymore, so he spends more time indoors. So I, I, he and I have done this book together very quickly. Um, I think we started right, well, it, it, it's finished and obviously going through the process of it with the publishing house. Um, but we did it in less than about six months. Wow. So uh, for you, you've never had an, uh, an, an issue or problem writing. You're able to just write and you're not self-conscious about writing or thinking ab- about whether you're good enough. You know, none of that. Eh? Really? No. Um, I mean, when the first few books came out, uh, obviously the first one was a big success. The first novel I wrote, Common People, didn't sell very many and I got a bit disheartened. But now I just, just do it and, um, hope people like it. If they don't, I don't get upset about it. Fortunately, I'm not writing for a living. I, I, I had a, a separate career that um, I was able to sell the company I worked for, and it gave me the luxury of being able to write and not worry about the sales. And most most of them have done all right. I mean, you know, yeah. run a couple of flops. Yeah. Harry Denton is a wank. Yeah. a flop. Excuse the pun. Well, there's always going to be one or two. It's just the way it goes, you know. Yeah. And look, except for Gavin. Gavin's just nothing but no, ugly. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, listen. So, listen. Now, your book, of course, is, will be at um, Amazon and stuff for people, and L- London Books yeah. as well. You're you're on there, and your books are all available through there as well. Yep. London, www.london-books.co.uk. Nearly all the books we've spoken about are available there. Fantastic. Now, do you have a, a website or anything that you promote or any uh, social media that you kind of hang out on, or do you stay away from that? I'm on, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, okay. at Martin Knight underscore. Well, fantastic. Now, what we'll do is we'll make sure, not we'll make sure that's up on the website as well so we have it. And uh, so we appreciate you being here, and, um, and hopefully your new book does well. You know, hopefully people uh, pick I it up. I hope so. And, you know. You're nice. You know, see what happens. We'll wish you the best. So, Mar- Martin Knight, thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.